take your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Psalms 51. Psalms 51. You remember last week we talked about the terrible, terrible sin of David. We are in the midst of a series of sermons, heart to heart. And we noticed and realized something last week that breaks our heart. He was a man after God's own heart, and yet he fell into sin, and he fell into the sin of immorality. And for over a, a, a year, he tried to hide that sin. And he was filled with all kinds of guilt and conviction. And Psalms 51 is the prayer that he made of coming clean before the Lord. A prayer. I, I'm kind of reminded of a prayer that I read. And you might can identify with this prayer. I, I said that Psalms 51, I titled that a prayer of a backslider. And I don't know of any prayer that depicts a backslider as well as a one that's coming clean before the Lord. But here is another prayer I read that I think you might will identify. Listen to what he says. Dear God, so far today, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent. I'm very thankful for that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed. And from then on, I'm probably going to need your help a lot. <laughs> Can you identify with that? Boy, I can. Heard about a little boy one time. He and his sister, his name was Johnny, and sister's name was Sally. And uh, they were spending the week with their grandparents. And uh, his grandfather had given Johnny a slingshot. Well, Johnny had never had a slingshot before, so he went out into the woods and uh, pick up a stone, and he would pull back on that slingshot, and he was shooting, and wasn't a very good shooter in the first place. <clears throat> but a little while later, he went out into the courtyard of this farm that they lived on, and all of a sudden... He saw the eye, or he put his eye upon his grandmother's pet duck. And little Johnny took a stone, and he pulled that slingshot back, and wham! Right between the eyes of that duck, and that old duck just fell over dead. Well, he panicked. And so he went rushing over, and he took that duck, and he hid it in the woodpile. And as he was hiding it in the woodpile, there was his little sister Sally watching the whole thing. She didn't say a word. That afternoon, they went in for dinner, and they were sitting around the table. And uh, the grandmother looked at Sally, and she says, Now, Sally, I want you to help me to wash the dishes when we get through. She said, oh, grandmother, she said, Johnny's already volunteered. <laughs> Johnny looked at her, and, he, and she whispered at him, remember the duck? <laughs> A little while later, Grandpa said, Johnny and Sally, I want you to go with me to go fishing. And uh, Grandma spoke up and says, oh, we can't do that. She said, I, I want Sally to help me to clean up the house. Sally said, 
Johnny's already volunteered for that. Johnny looked at her and he said, you remember the duck? After a day or so, that went on. And every time that Sally was supposed to do something, she volunteered Johnny. And Johnny would go ahead and do it. He'd buy, grit his teeth and he'd go on. So finally, he just got tired of the guilt that he was experiencing. He went to his grandmother and said, Grandma, I've got something to say. She said, what is it, John? He said, well, you remember your pet duck? Yeah. I shot it with a, a, a slingshot, and I am so sorry. She looked at him. She said, oh, Johnny. She said, that's all right. She said, I saw you when you shot him. <laughs> and I just wondered how long you was going to let Sally make a slave out of you. <laughs> Did you know that's what sin does? Sin will make a slave out of you and make you do things that you shouldn't be doing make you do things that you don't want to do, and the conviction just becomes overwhelming. That's exactly the way David was experienced. He was a miserable man for a solid year. He tried to cover up his sins for a solid year. He thought he could outmaneuver and certainly out knowing God in that God would know this situation. Satan and sin, they work along and they'll make a slave out of you. Until finally, Nathan, of course, you remember, pointed his finger at him, the prophet, the preacher, and he said, after he gave him a little sermon and talking about uh, a, a traveler coming by and was needing uh, food, and a rich man who had plenty went over to a poor man's house, and all that man had was one little pet ewe lamb. And he took that little lamb and he gave it to the traveler. And David, with rage of vengeance, he said, that man shall suffer fourfold, and he shall die. And Nathan, of course, raised his finger and said, David, thou art the man. You're the guilty one. David becomes starting to become clean before the Lord. And here in this prayer, I want you to listen to it very carefully, and we're going to examine it. Stand with me as we read this verse of Scripture. Now, I want you to just not read it, but try to imagine David on his knees Tears streaming from his cheeks with a broken and contrite heart. A man that has tried to hide his sin for a year. He starts out by saying, oh, have mercy upon me, O oh God. According to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. He just seems like he can't express his sin enough. Three different times 
he talks about his sins. He says, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me. Listen to what he's saying. He is saying, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all, not some, all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. But oh, look at his plea. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore. Oh, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me by your generous spirit. Then, oh, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me, O oh God, from the guilt of bloodshed, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Oh, Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. But all oh, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Thieves, O oh God, you will not despise. Can you imagine? This is a prayer that David gave. <laughs> And that prayer, my friend, is much of truth and reality today when a man and a woman has backslidden on the Lord. Oh, dear God, help us to enter into the prayer closet of David. Allow us to eavesdrop upon the conversation that he has had with you. From a time of brokenness, a time of conviction, a time of repentance, a time of a contrite heart. Oh, dear God. They may be someone here today need to be praying the same prayer because of a hidden sin, because of a guilt, because of the slavery of sin. Oh, dear God, 
Help us to have an open mind and open heart to be able to receive the mighty truths that you have before us today through this passage of Scripture. And Father, we'll thank you for your love and for your mercy, for your grace, for your forgiveness. We thank you for the restoration of your joy. Bless now in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe be seated. You can tell a lot about a man by the way he prays. And this was a man that I don't think he had prayed too much in the last year. This was a man that was once was a man that was known as one of singing and rejoicing and dancing before the Lord. Here was a man that would write songs about his love and the majesty and the glory and the honor of Almighty God. But for a year now, ever since he committed the terrible sin of adultery and the terrible sin of murder, he has grown silent. I find it quite often that when a man or a woman finds themselves in the sin, they drift far, far, far away from that fellowship that they once had with the Lord. They no longer pray like they used to pray. They no longer look forward to coming to church like they used to come and look forward to. They no longer enjoy the songs of Zion. It's just mundane. And they just go through a routine. And their heart has become cold and callous. But oh, something happened when Nathan, that prophet, that preacher, and oh, thank God for the faithfulness of this man. Can you imagine how hard it must have been for Nathan to go before David and confront him with his sin? David was the, the king. He was the man above all men. And now go and point your finger and confront him with a sin as adultery, murder. But because of the faithfulness of that preacher, he went on that journey. And there, as he stood before David, and I believe with a finger in the face of David, he says, Thou art the man. David immediately realized he was guilty as charged. Immediately, David said, I have sinned. Somewhere along that time, David wrote this psalm. And there's four things that I want to point out to you about a backslider's prayer as we look at David. First of all, I want you to notice in verses 3 and 4, and that is the guilt that he experienced. Oh, can you imagine a man after God's own heart, a man that who walked with the Lord, that all of a sudden has found himself in sin such as this, of the guilt the conviction. And instead of running to God when this sin took place, he was running from God. 
And he thought, like old Jonah, I could outrun God. And yet he realized that he couldn't. The Lord had confronted him. Look at that verse of Scripture, verse 3 and 4. Listen to, listen to how he makes this prayer so personal. I acknowledge my transgressions. He didn't say it was my brother, it's my sister, it's my mother, it's my dad's fault. It's me. I'm the guilty party. Until you come to a point and place a realizing that it's, you cannot put the blame on somebody else, but you have to accept responsibility of your actions. And so, therefore, he says, it is my transgression, it is my sin that is ever before me against you, and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. David come to the realization that the only knife that could lance the ball of guilt was the knife of confession. What is confession? Confession is agreeing with God in what he says it is. Instead of no longer trying to cover up, he is uncovering his sin. Notice how he says all the different uh, personal pronouns, my sins, my transgressions, my iniquities. And there you began to see how confession is so important of coming to the first step toward repentance. David needed to repent, but before he could repent, he had to acknowledge his sins. I was remember reading about two little boys one time were playing. One was a Catholic and one was a Protestant. And of course, you know, Catholics that uh, they have a time of confession of going before the priest and confessing their sins. Well, these two little boys were talking and they, this little boy that was a Catholic says, my priest says this. The Protestant said, well, my pastor says this. Well, my priest knows more than your pastor does. And the little Protestant little boy says, well, he should. You tell him everything. <laughs> <coughs> well, I want you to know God already knows, doesn't he? Whether you tell him or whether you don't tell him, God already knows. And so what David is doing was just acknowledging, just agreeing. Look what he says. And I want you to notice of how he depicts his sins in three different ways. Look at with me in verses 1 and 2. He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, According to your multitude of your tender mercies, blot out what? My transgressions. Now, what is transgressions? Transgressions is someone crossing over a forbidden territory. You remember God gave Moses up in the Mount Sinai the Ten Commandments, and one of the commandments, he said, thy shall not commit adultery. Thy shall not commit adultery. In other words, he had put a border. He is saying that the relationship between a husband and wife is holy, is pure, is sanctified. Don't go out of the boundaries. And if you go out of the boundaries, having a relationship with another 
person, a man or a woman, outside your husband or your wife, that you have committed transgressions. You have crossed over the boundary. But notice what else he says. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. The word iniquity, what, what does the word iniquity mean? Well, the word iniquity comes from the word perversity or pervert. In other words, it is perverse to think that you can do something outside of God's holy nature and God's will. And so he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, my perverse action, my perverted ways. And then he goes on a step further, and he says, and cleanse me from my sin. Three different times he refers to his iniquity, his perversion, his transgressions, crossing the border, and now he says the sin. What does the sin mean? Missing the mark. In other words, if a marksman was going to shoot at the bullseye and he misses, He's missed the mark. Well, the Bible reminds us that the mark of God is holiness, purity. And when you walk outside of that, you've missed the mark. David has come to the realization, and, and it seems as if he can't express his sin enough. He can't confess it enough. He can't acknowledge it enough before the Lord. And so he just goes into depth of explaining. In other words, what David come to the realization was he didn't have just an affair. He committed adultery. He didn't just happen to put a man on the front lines of warfare and happenstance, he got killed. David committed second-degree murder. He crossed the border. He missed the mark. He perverted God's ways. And therefore, he's acknowledging. But notice what he does after he acknowledges. First of all, he says, blot. I think that's interesting. Blot out our transgressions. Blot out my transgressions. Did you realize sin leaves a mark? So when you think about blotting out, you think of something that is written on a ledger or something that's in a book or something that is in a place that has it listed. Could it possibly be that unconfessed sin is listed in the heart of God? Of course it is. And if you do not confess those sins, you're going to have to give an account. And what David has said, oh, God, blot out, wash it away, mark through it, take it away. I don't want this to stand before me any longer. And so he says, blot out. You know what David was doing. I think it's interesting to notice that David had come to an understanding that there's two sins that you cannot repay. Now, if I steal from you, 
I can take the merchandise I've stole, have stolen from you and give back to you. But there's two sins you cannot do that to. One is adultery, and two is murder. Once it's been done, it's been done. You can't undo it. You can't bring a life back. You can't bring purity back all of a sudden just because you feel guilty. And so he says, blot out. And then he uses another in interesting word. He uses the word, wash me. David felt dirty. Did you know sin will make you feel dirty? Sin will make you feel dirty. He says, wash away my iniquity. In other words, David said, I not only just feel guilty, I feel dirty. I feel everything about me is dirty. I've been contaminated with sin. And I need to be washed. I, I love to work out in the yard. And on a hot summer day, I get out there and I have my shorts on, my T-shirt on, and I get grungy and dirty. But you know what's so refreshing? <clears throat> to come inside and take a good shower and to be clean. Smell clean, feel clean. So refreshing. David is saying, my soul is grungy, it's dirty, it's filthy, it's sweaty. I need the shower of God, his blood to wash me. But then he goes a step further and he says, cleanse me, cleanse me. The word cleanse literally means purge. Purge me. You know what literally David was saying when he says purge me? He was literally saying, if there is such a word, descend me. Make me as if I never sinned. Only you, God, can do that. Purge me. Take that cancer of sin away. And so therefore, you notice immediately the guilt that he experienced. But all oh, look with me in verse 10 of the grace that was extended. It seems as if David takes a deeper, deeper Look at himself. Not only outward, but he is looking inward. Not only had he committed a sin physically, but he had committed a sin spiritually. Forgiveness was not all he needed. He was needing purity. He was not only needing a pardon, but he was needing a purity. Listen to what he says in verse 10. Create in me, what? A pure heart. Create in me. Here's an adulterer. Here's a murderer. And he's coming before Almighty God. And he says, God, not only are my hands are dirty, but I've got a heart problem. David realized the heart of the problem was the problem of the heart. He says, create in me a pure heart. Oh, 
God, renew a steadfast spirit within me. In other words, he realized that he was needing radical, radical surgery. He was needing a heart transplant. That it went much deeper than just the action. See, a lot of people say, oh, I, I confess my sin, and, and they think of it only on the action aspect of it. They don't think that it goes deeper. They don't realize it goes to the heart. I find it interesting where he used the word create. It's the same identical word in Genesis 1 when God created the heavens and the earth. You know what that means? Out of nothing, he made something. David is saying, God, out of nothing will you make something. Create in me a new heart. And the Bible says, as he cries out, he says, I want not only a change from the outside, but I want the change to begin from the inside out. You know what happens a lot of times with a lot of people who have pet sins? They find themselves constantly confessing the same sin, whether it's pornography, whether it's adultery, whether it's cheating on taxes, lying, losing your temper. And they find themselves constantly coming before the Lord. Oh, God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. And they go right back and they continue doing that same sin. What's happened? They're only looking at the symptom instead of the problem. The problem is the heart. And until the heart changes, the actions will never change. Oh, yes, you may feel guilty. Yes, you may ask for forgiveness. Yes, you may repent. And you say, I'm never going to do this again. And then the next thing you know, you find yourself falling right back into that sin. David come to an understanding of that. And so that what David has said, Lord, create in me a new heart. I need purity. I need your purity. I need your holiness. But thirdly, I want you to notice something. <clears throat> Not only the guilt that he experienced and the grace that was extended to him, but notice with me the glory that he expressed. Look what he says in verse 11. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. That's kind of disturbing. When you first read this, it's a strange statement. Uh, is David saying something like this, that God's presence could be removed from my life? Is he saying that the Holy Spirit could be removed from my life? Is he saying I could be lost again? No, that's not what he's saying. My friend, once you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, God's presence will always will be in your life. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says that he has sealed you until the day of redemption. But oh, my friend, you can push God so far away, it almost feels like he's no longer there. See, there's two things. If a person's going to be pure and holy, 
There's two things that must be, that must happen in his life. Number one, he must have the presence of Almighty God. I seek salvation. And he must have the power of Almighty God. That's the Holy Spirit. I have before uh, talked with individuals who I'd witnessed to, and numerous times I've had individuals say, well, Pastor, I would like to get saved, but I can't get saved because I can't live that kind of life. And they're surprised when I say, you know, you're exactly right. You cannot live that kind of life with the absence of the presence of God and with the absence of the presence of the power of God. Thankfully, that when you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, all of God that God is comes into your life at that moment. And he never leaves. That doesn't mean he has all of you. So David come to a realization that if I'm going to live a life of purity, I need the presence of Almighty God. I need the power of Almighty God. And when that takes place, when Jesus said, or yes, be ye holy as I am holy, in order for you to experience that holiness, it's not what you can do, it's what God can do through you. This is what David is referring to. What happens when that takes place? There's two things that happens. When you come back before the Lord and you have repented, you've confessed, and that the presence and the power of Almighty God is being demonstrated in your life, two things will be evident. You say, you mean to know You mean to tell me I can know? Absolutely. First of all, I want you to know you'll be a witness. Look what he says in verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will be turned back. So he talked about the glory that is expressed. And then he talks about the gladness that is expected. Look what the Bible says as he says, Then, see, sin not only soils the soul, but friend, I want you to know it seals the lips. You take a person that's out of the will of God. You take a person that is living in sin. You take a person that have and that are experiencing guilt of sin. Guess what happens? One of the first things, you you get a lockjaw. You're not telling others about Jesus. But you get a person that gets saved or a person that is renewed and restored and the fellowship of God Almighty is upon him and the power of God is upon him and the presence of Almighty God is upon him. You know what? You can't keep that man's mouth shut. He's telling everybody, let me tell you what God's done in my life. He may not be the best singer, but boy, he'll sing the loudest (laughs) because of the joy. That's what he says. Created me the joy. See, David was not asking 
that God would resave him. He never says in here, God, you saved me again. No. He says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Gladness. And there was witnessing. And not only were there witnessing, there was worshiping. For the first time in a year, David starts to worship. Look what the Bible says. Open my lips in verse 15. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Open my lips. The worship of David has been restored. You know what sin will do? Sin will keep you from God or God will keep you from sin. Sin will keep you from the Bible or the Bible will keep you from sin. Here is a man. I know God's forgiven me. Oh, I feel so clean, David says. I've just been washed. My sins have been blotted out. God's not going to hold that against me any longer. God's forgiven me. He's restored to me my joy that I once had, that I've lost. But today, I've got it back. Praise be to God. I've got it back. There's two things that will guarantee you if you're in sin today that God can do the same thing in your life. Number one, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two is his blood. What did Jesus Christ do? He did not come into this world in vain. He did not come just to save you, that you go to heaven. As important as that is. He's come to save you, that you can live a pure, holy, clean life. And through his blood that he shed upon the cross of Calvary, As the Bible says, even though my sins may be as crimson, as ugly, as dirty, as filthy as it can be, as wretched, through his blood, he washes me, makes me whiter than snow. Oh, thank you, Jesus for saving me not only of my sins, but of my stupidities. Every prayer, every day I, I, in my prayer life, I, I say something like this, Lord, help me not to do something stupid today. Because without God, my friend, you end up doing something stupid. David realized this. And God cleansed him and restored him. Oh, he had to suffer the consequences, yes. Yeah, he suffered. He suffered fourfold. You can't undo what sin has done as far as consequences. But God will forgive you. And he will cleanse you. And he'll give you words of praise on your lips. And he'll give you joy and a song in your heart. I wonder if I've been talking to somebody today. Playing around with sin. No one else knows anything about it. But God does. God does. It's not going to get any better. Guilt's not going to get any better. 
Conviction's not going to get any better. In fact, I've got news for you. It's going to get worse until you come clean. My prayer is that you'll come clean like 